Tom Miller, welcome to BRI Dialogues. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Very few people understand uh, the developments of uh, Asia, the way you have done it and dug in as a connoisseur traveling these geographies. There's a lot of talk about the, the cliches, as Anoush calls them, the tiger and the dragon. But there is so much of anticipation that India is coming of age. And in a post-COVID world, having studied these markets, economies, and their trajectory, do you think that really India is a contender in global economy and will bounce back as a, you know, a tiger, being in the year of tiger, to challenge the dragon? Right. Well, for some reason, though, India, um, although, of course, it actually has tigers, um, it's always called the elephant. <laughs> um, and, you know, sort of one reason for that is that it's always traditionally been rather slow. Um, but, you know, there's a, India has huge potential. Um, and sort of 15 years ago, um, when, um, when actually more like 10 years ago, when India was 10 to 15 years ago, you know, India was shining, supposedly. People got very, very excited about um, the outlook for, um, for, um, for India. Then things slowed down a little bit. And then Modi came into power, people got excited again. Um, but actually, you know, India's had a very, very tough time of this. And um, of course, it was hit very hard by the pandemic, but actually it was slowing down enormously before then. So, you know, you had sort of um, quarterly growth um, was, at about, was at about 3% before the pandemic hit. Um, and um, annual growth was at about 4% um, in, in, in 2019. Um, and so, um, you know, we were getting quite negative on India even before the pandemic. Um, and the pandemic has been particularly tough actually um, on India. Now there's a lot of optimism right now. And I think a lot of that really um, is due to kind of, kind of um, base effects, if you like. So the Indian economy is bouncing back. Um, there's a lot of growth there now, and people are excited because um, it is, you know, the fastest growing large economy in the world, or was probably going to be when the numbers come out. So it looks like for the current fiscal year, which finishes at the, at the end of March, it'll grow at sort of 9% plus. And then we're looking at sort of 8% for the next year or two, there or thereabouts. So India's sort of getting back to the sort of growth trajectory that people um, saw a decade ago. Um, but what people forget, though, is that um, the, the sort of bottom half of India um, have done very, very badly. Um, and the economy is deeply scarred um, by the pandemic. Inequality has grown. Um, in fact, there is more poverty in India today than there was before the pandemic. Um, GDP per capita um, has fallen, um, but a lot of this has been, um, it, it's, it's been um, sort of hidden um, by the fantastic stock market performance until recently, if you like. And that's because a lot of the, the growth that has come back um, recently has really accrued um, to um, very big business and the formal economy. So it's the informal economy that has suffered very, very badly. Um, and so, you know, do I think India has potential? Of course it does. You know, it's got fantastic demographics, which are equally actually as much of a challenge um, as they are a kind of dividend, but it does have that. And it's actually quite difficult for India not to grow. You know, it has so many young people coming into the economy. But India has really struggled, though, um, to make the kind of structural reforms it needs to kind of boost productivity. And so while I'd say, yes, it does still have huge potential, it also has big, big problems. Um, and one thing that's really worried me um, over the past sort of two or three years in particular um, is that as the economy slowed, um, sort of Modi's government really did fall back on what we'd worried about when Modi came into power. And that was, you know, would he be a sort of economic reformer? Would he open up to business and do all the things we wanted him to do? Or would he really... Um, double down on his whole Hindu for you know sort of Hindu nationalist um, agenda, um, and you know we've seen a lot of that. Now I think the hope now is that post pandemic, you know, economic growth is really the priority. Um, we saw that again actually yesterday when the, mon the monetary policy committee um, didn't um, raise interest rates. You know it, it's all about growth at the moment, um, and so I really hope now that they that they begin to prioritise the economy. Um, reform, pushing things forward, rather than um, that sort of political agenda, which can only be damaging um, and will only um, lead to sort of fractures within the economy. So, you know, I, I think it's a very mixed picture in India, but, you know, on a sort of medium to sort of long-term basis, if they get it right, of course, it has huge potential. 
that's that's my cue, Tom, because I mean that's a wonderful place for you to to pause. Um, I, I see you, and I love your your book, uh, China's Asia Dream, and and where you delve deep into the Silk Road uh, and related material. That you're a big picture person who has an eye for minutiae detail at the same time, and that's a very uh, hard trick to get right, and you do it uh, very ably. Pressing you a bit on what we used to call Chindia, right? I was at the World Economic Forum when both China and India were in the frame, and much of that year's forum was focused on Chindia, and the two of them were bragging about the growth, the two of them were showing off the potential and the ability and so on, and you know, it was a race for second place in many ways, as far as I was concerned with regard to India. Now, the issues with India, and here it's about geopolitics and in comparison with China, Tom, is that the Chinese seem to have a very clear image in their own minds of what reform means, what strategy means, and where they would like to see China in a 10 or 15 year cycle. We celebrate India as a world's greatest, largest democracy and so on. But underneath that, of course, lies huge chaos and also absence of strategy, for want of a better word, of where does India want to locate itself? I think it's now very passe to use the term Chindia, but what do you think India needs to learn from China, both in terms of an economic competitor, but also in terms of China seems to have got it right on so many levels that India hasn't. Right. Well, yes, um, the idea of Chindia fell out of fashion a long time ago. Um, and of course, you know, sort of, it, 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 sort of part of the idea was that India and China could sort of work together or be you know, the two big giants. Um, and that was always going to be very, very difficult because of the just huge um, mistrust between the two countries. And, you know, we don't want to go into the details now, but of course, you know, we've had some um, people firing guns on, you know, in the Himalayas, you know, for the first time in 40 years. Um, so that was all very, very difficult. Um, what can India learn from China? Well, if you go back to when Modi took power um, in 2014, uh, Modi was somebody who traveled to China a lot. Um, and in Gujarat, he had supposedly been you know, inspired by some of those sort of Chinese reforms of sort of opening up to business and letting the state um, get out of the way in certain respects. So of course, you know, um, China's rise has been kind of very state led, but, but, but equally it's allowed the private sector to get ahead too. It's, it's been a sort of, a, sort of a, a very, very careful mix. But I would say, you know, the one thing that India probably needs to do um, is to boost man manufacturing. Um, you know, sort of India's, if India has one single problem, it is that it doesn't create enough jobs. Um, and actually in some respects, you can say that India is lacking sort of 200 to 250 million jobs. If you look at the labor participation rates in India, which um, are only worse in, a, in two or three Middle Eastern countries where women just cannot work at all. And in fact, you know, women in India barely work, you know, in the in the real economy. Um, you know, the labor, labor participation rates are in the cities are only at about 10 or 12 percent or something, you know, sort of crazy low levels. Um, but um, manufacturing is a share of GDP um, is, um, you know, still at about 15 percent, um, very, very low, you know, sort of China was sort of sort of about twice that. Um, and that's something that Modi was talking about doing and India have really struck, India has really struggled to do. Um, and you know, if you're going to grow, then manufacturing is that sort of first rung um, on the ladder. Um, you know, India has manufacturing; it just doesn't have enough, um, and it doesn't have enough of that labour-intensive manufacturing that can employ lots and lots of people. So, um, I think that's one thing. And you know, a, a, an obvious example here is to look at um, the textiles and really the garment sector, and the kind of different things. So, textiles is more capital-intensive; garments is about sort of people cutting and and, and sewing clothes um, together. And of course, that's something that China, um, you know, it was, it was huge in China. It still, it still is big, you know, but now that labor costs have risen in China and China sort of moved up the value chain, it's, you know, some of that is moving to other countries, but Bangladesh has taken a lot of that rather than India. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's an enormous shame for India. Um, and another thing though, would be construction and real estate. You know, obviously if you go to India, there is huge construction, but India doesn't really have um, the, the very large real estate um, companies that China has. Um, 
it's now there are a few beginning to grow, but they tend to be based, um, uh, they're very kind of regional or kind of city based. Um, and sort of India, um, it, it, it doesn't work so well as a, as a sort of single country um, as, as, as China does. And they've been trying to change that. Um, the goods and services tax um, is, is one way of trying to kind of bring the country together. Um, and along with better infrastructure too, which is also something that India needs to do and has been doing. And actually infrastructure in India has improved enormously in the last decade um, or so. But I would say construction is the other thing. And, and I actually had include infrastructure in that in terms of job creation. It's the other really big thing that can, that can employ people at the bottom. And you know, if India has one huge weakness, it's that the country only works well for you know, a, a small segment of society. And um, I don't think you're ever going to fulfill your potential, or grow as rich as you should, if um, you know half the country or, or in India, you could say two thirds of the country just really isn't in the economy proper. Mm. That's something that China did did very very well indeed. Um, and you know this is also based in education. It's based in healthcare. You know, China still has huge um, huge challenges there, but it's done it's done an infinitely better job um, than um, than than India. You know everyone knows this stuff. But it never seems to change, right. um, you know. And if you look at just the recent budget in India, now you know personally, I think they they kind of got it right in that you know they're prioritizing growth um, and capital investment. I think that's what India needs at the moment, and actually that will create jobs. But they're still not doing anything for um, for um, for extra investment in health, for example, after a pandemic, you know. And these are things that, that India, I think, spends about one percent of GDP on health. Now, you know, these sorts of things do matter. Um, and um, you know, India will always struggle um, if it doesn't um, if it doesn't make sort of sort of reforms that don't that not only open up the economy, but also try to kind of invest in its people, because that's also a part of a part of boosting productivity. So you know, India does have these enormous challenges and um, you know, and, and it's very difficult in India because of the system um, of governance there, you know. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of the way China is governed in many respects. You know, I'm somebody who lived in China for 14 years. And, um, you know, it's these days, I don't have many friends left there. And it's not just because of the pandemic. Um, it's, you know, it's for various obvious reasons. You know, it's a highly authoritarian country where, where you are monitored. Um, you know, India um, has become more authoritarian over the last three years, but it certainly isn't like that. Um, and India couldn't be like that because it has to be a democracy um, in order to work. Um, you know, it's a very diverse country. You know, it's a country, um, you know, sort of it's, its individual states are incredibly different. You know, people speak different languages in a way they don't quite do in China where they've had a very deliberate policy since 1949 of bringing people together. But, you know, it's a, it's a very diverse place and you cannot have a government with, with that sort of authoritarian bent um, in the same way. So it's difficult. Um, but, you know, India does need to do a, a, a better job of boosting manufacturing, of boosting construction and investing in its people. I think there were three things I'd point to. Uh, I, I know Ali wants to come in, but just relating to that, two, two quick follow ups, Tom. One is, so if India is looking at, at the world, you know, in the 2030s, where do you think its competitive advantage might be in relation to China? You know, you mentioned manufacturing. We talk about uh, IT, we talk about uh, pharmaceuticals and medicine and so on. But in my view, that's not going to cut it for 1.2 billion people or also put India on a very different growth trajectory. That's one. The other is, if you were sitting in Beijing looking at India, what would you worry about looking into the 2030s in terms right. of well, India? Okay, so the first thing to say, and is that it's not 1.2, it's 1.4 billion um, already. I mean, this is, you know, in India is growing so fast. Now, it's not growing so fast because people are having lots of babies. They're not anymore, actually. But it's, it's growing fast because it's still a very, very young country. Um, and, you know, I'm making this point, point um, deliberately because that is the, the big difference, I think, between India and China in the 2030s. Okay, so, you know, um, China's population, um, it's, it's, it's already sort of peaking now. Um, you know, we don't know exactly what the numbers are, and frankly, nor does, nor does Beijing. But you know, it's it's uh, it, it seems actually that it's going to peak earlier than they thought. Maybe at about sort of one point four five billion. They used to think it'd be more like one point five billion, um, and it's very difficult to kind of count all, all these people. Um, but you know, um, India will overtake China within a couple of years. 
Um, and um, and it's, it's not just a question of having more people, it's a question of having much younger people. So, you know, um, China is now um, an aging society. Um, and, you know, um, uh, India's big problem is um, employing all the, all the young people it has, but it does have a lot of youth. And so if it can find ways of employing them, that gives it a huge advantage. And, you know, that's why partly why China grew so quickly over the past sort of 20 or 30 years was because of you know, it had a demographic engine. So you know, that, I think, is, is the big difference between the two countries. Um, at the same time, you've got to think that you know, so China is, is five times richer um, than India on a, on a per capita basis, and India is not going to catch up. You know, if it ever does, it's, not, it's, it's going to take a long time to catch up. And you know, China's just massively ahead in terms of things like technology. Of course, there are things that India does well. You know, it does have, um, you know, it has a lot of good computer programmers, actually probably in AI, although China is, you know, is, is this big kind of scary kind of AI sort of sort of dystopia, supposedly. Actually, apparently, when it comes to sort of AI programmers, India has has better programmers. You know, I'm not an expert on this sort of thing, but, you know, it, 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 it does have that advantage. Um, you'd also think that, you know, India's sort of openness to the world, potentially, if it plays its cards right, you know, that could be helpful too. You know, China at the moment um, is really, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, well, it's, it's, it's temporarily closed. Um, it's flirting with, with, with closing in a much more kind of structural way, which I think could really hurt China potentially. You know, it, it has this policy um, of trying to become a tech power. You know, it wants to catch up with the US on things like semiconductors, all those sorts of things. Um, you know, it may get there, it's throwing huge money at it, but it's gonna be quite difficult if it's closed off from the, from the world and the US and its allies, you know, make it almost impossible for China to buy in tech. So that is, that is something I think that will also really challenge China potentially. So it does come down partly to, China's relations with the rest of the world. Um, yes, I think I think that's what I'd say initially to that answer that question. Tom, I think none of this can be separated from the geopolitical realities on the ground. And um, as somebody who has been, you know, um, um, and talking to institutions, think tanks, you know, um, State Department, Chatham House. Do you think that the West really understands the complexities and dynamics of China's ambitions? And from there, I wanna as well go to the fitting of India in a post-Afghanistan world. The AFPAC, as it was called, can now be called CHAFPAC. You add China <laughs> and Afghanistan and Pakistan to that. Do you think that U.S. having had Afghanistan to itself for 20 years, or the West for that matter, not understanding what they dealt with, understand the complexities of China in this geopolitical narrative, and where does India fit into this picture in a post-Afghanistan world for its economic ambitions, and China's more encroaching into that uh, Triangle. Okay, so on the first question, does the, the West understand China's ambitions? Well, I think it understands them much better now than it did. You know, so uh, when I first wrote this book, um, you know, it came out in 2017, but the research was really between 2013, 14 to 16. Okay, so, um, you know, for the book, I, you know, I traveled around a dozen countries in Asia, um, and it was very clear to see, you know, sort of China's ambitions sort of happening there um, on the ground. But I think I was almost, you know, I'm not an academic, but I was almost the first person that I knew of at least to put my finger on, I'm not boasting here, but I'm trying to think back at the time, um, to the fact that China was, had really abandoned its kind of hide and bite um, dictum. Okay, so this was, you know, this was sort of Deng Xiaoping's formula of saying we shouldn't raise our head above the parapet because we might get shot down, right? So in Chinese, it's called Tao Guang Yang Hui, which literally means in Chinese, and Tao means hide, Guang means light, Yang means um, nurture, and Hui means obscurity. So hide light, nurture, obscurity, okay, Tao Guang Yang Hui. Um, and, you know, Xi Jinping, when he came to power, you know, literally the first thing he did was to stand um, on the edge of Tiananmen Square, you know, and announced that he wanted to achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese um, people, you know. 
or, or Chinese nation, how, how, how they want to translate it. Um, now, now, this wasn't a new formula. People had spoken about this sort of since the 1930s or whatever, but, 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 yeah, but he, was, he was putting that at the, at the kind of very center of, of policy um, again. And, you know, to put it into sort of Trumpian terms, it means you know, make China great again. That's what he's been trying to do. Um, and he called this the Chinese dream or the China dream. Now, sort of people, you know, it, that was all reported in the press. Nobody really knew what it meant, but I'm not sure people took it that seriously. People knew that China was rising but they didn't sort of know that China was going to be so kind of deliberate um, and, you know, it was going to be so kind of proactive, if you like, in, in its sort of political ambitions. And so, you know, if you look at the Belt and Road Initiative, it's about lots of things, but, you know, one of the major ambitions they have really is for China to be um, a sort of leader, um, an economic leader um, of the sort of developing world. Um, and so the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, it's about sort of financing infrastructure development, among other things, in countries that need it. But by doing that, you, you create some kind of you know, political linkages, sort of political leverage, um, and economic and geopolitical dependencies. Um, and so although China was doing this before Xi Jinping, it was, it, it, Xi Jinping has sort of repackaged it and gave it much more um, uh, sort of much more political capital was put behind it, um, if you like. Um, and I, I don't think people woke up to this at first. Um, I think they really began to um, under Trump, actually. You know, so Trump had this kind of very sort of anti, um, anti sort of China line. And you saw that from 2018 in particular. Obviously, you had the, the, the that was when the US China trade war really started, but also with the Belt and Road, that's when you had Trump's attack dogs. So Mike Pence, Pompeo, John Bolton, these guys coming out with the whole kind of debt trap narrative, predatory lending, all of that kind of stuff. But I think that was when they really began to realize, hey, you know, um, these guys are serious and they're winning, <laughs> you know. So in, in, in the developing world, you know, the US had really lost its influence and China had kind of stepped into the breach and was lending lots and lots of money, doing lots and lots of things and sort of really building up pockets of political influence, you know. So if you look around the world, it, it has sort of a, um, a bunch of um, sort of forums it uses. So if you look at Africa, it's called FOCAC, the Forum on, on China-Africa Cooperation. If you look at Central and Eastern Europe, it's called 17 plus one. Um, if you look across Asia, you know, it's, it's got, it's got it's, it works with ASEAN, China and ASEAN. It's got the Shanghai Cooperative, um, sorry, co-cooperation co, 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 organization across Central Asia, now including India and, and um, as well and Pakistan. Um, it's got China CELAC in Latin America. Where do you go? China has these forums, you know, and it gets together with these countries, takes them very seriously. Um, its leaders visit all these countries. They work very hard, much harder than the US, and they take them seriously. You know, they give them, they give them face. Um, and I think, you know, the US now understands that, which is now why we're seeing the US and its allies trying to um, fight back with things like build back better worlds, you know, which is meant to be a sort of Western attempt to take on the Belt and Road. It's not gonna work. I don't think they're putting enough money into it, but you know, they, it shows they're taking it seriously. So I, I think people do now know <laughs> that China's a threat. <laughs> so that's the first question. Um, the second question was, you know, uh, talking about chaff pack, which I was yeah, which that's a new before, term. But, um, we yeah, coined I, together today. Chaff I rather pack. like that. I mean, it's, it sounds like a sort of it sounds like a sort of nasty case of either chafing thighs or something. So, I, mean, I don't know, but it's um, <laughs> it, it, it's uh, um, um, yeah, but yes. I mean, obviously, you know, China has had you know deep influence in Pakistan for um, a long time. Um, it's a relationship of, of convenience, you know, um, for both of them, it, it's, it's about keeping India off, off guard. You know, if India's looking towards China and the Himalayas, you know, um, then, it, then, then that means that, that it's kind of ignoring Pakistan. And if it's looking at Pakistan, it's kind of ignoring um, the, um, the other side. So it's difficult for India. Um, and so that's why you have all this crazy rhetoric about the relationship being sweeter than honey, you know, higher than the highest heavens, so all that kind of nonsense um, that they come out with. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a long term relationship, you know, China has no formal allies, but actually, I, I, you know, in the kind of Western military sense, it's not going to go to war for somebody. But, you know, I think it is, it is fair to say that actually Pakistan is a sort of political ally in a sense, and now Russia certainly a political ally too, and Russia is relevant to this whole discussion in Central, in Central Asia too. Um, so, you know, China has been um, 
it's been investing and you know lending huge amounts in Pakistan um, over the past decade, particularly since sort of 2015, 2016. So you look at the Belt and Road Initiative, Pakistan is the single biggest location globally um, of that. Um, so they have this initiative called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which makes it sound like you know um, it's sort of China and and Pakistan are going to be linked over land. To be honest, it's kind of nonsense. You know, they've had the Karakoram Highway, which was sort of built in the, in the 1980s. I mean, I traveled across it um, in, back in 2001, and I got stuck on the Chinese side for a little bit because there'd been a landslide. You know, that still happens. Um, it's a little road, it's been widened in recent years, but it's been closed for COVID. You know, it's for half the year, it's under snow. The other half of the year, you know, there are landslides. It's, 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 there's never going to be a pipeline from Gwadar, you know, in the Arabian Sea, um, across Pakistan to, to India, sorry, to China. There's never gonna be lots of trucks going across there. It'll all be quite small time. No, what, what CPEC really means um, is that um, China is, is lending lots of money and helping to build lots of useful things to Pakistan in Pakistan. So it's, it's not really about linking the countries, but it is still a very, very big deal. Pakistan sees this as a game changer. That's the word that's always used. Is it a game changer? Well, you can argue probably not quite a game changer, but it does mean that you know Pakistan has um, lots of new power stations it didn't have before. It has lots of new motorways it didn't have before. It has a new deep water port it didn't have before. It has lots of kind of useful things. Um, and to kind of bring India into this conversation, you know, China has built this port at Gwadar on the um, on the Arabian Sea. Um, I think you know its strategic influence. Sorry, the strategic. Um, um, import is often exaggerated um, because you know it's not a military base for the Chinese, but the point is it could become one, right? So um, you know it, it's never going to be, I think, a huge um, uh, a huge um, port in terms of um, sort of transporting sort of things between Pakistan and China or whatever. But you know it, it does potentially give the People's Liberation Army Navy naval access. Um, and so, you know, Djibouti is the first sort of official sort of military port that China has. Um, and, you know, Guadalajara could become another one near the Straits of Hormuz. So that's, you know, that's potentially very, very useful. And this, of course, is what India worries about terribly. You know, it has this old idea of the string of pearls, you know, that China is building, you know, the strategic string of pearls around Mother India. You know, it's going to strangle Mother India. So, you know, it, it, it looks at, it looks at, it looks at Sri Lanka with, with various investments there. You know, China now you know has this 99 year lease on Hamban Tota port. Again, another empty port, but again, it could provide access. You know, China's um, military submarines have docked in Colombo in the past. Um, it also has investments in Bangladesh, in Myanmar, and other places. Again, they're not really military, but you know, it, it, there's always potential for them to be used for military purposes if necessary. Um, and so, you know, India does worry. I, I, I think it often kind of exaggerates the, the strategic import um, of these, but, you know, you can see why if you're Indian, you should, you should worry about it. But I'll say one other thing on this before we maybe we'll get to Afghanistan. Um, you know, it was, it was after um, the latest Himalayan blow up, um, you know, couple, when was it now? Nearly, some, oh, yeah. nearly two years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, people said that, um, you know, that there was this whole pushback in India um, against working with Chinese, you know, they, um, the various investments um, um, were, you know, they, they um, were, um, um, were put on hold. Um, and there was lots of talk about um, in the, in, that India would buy its goods from other countries. In that sense, you know, you can see uh, similarities with other parts um, of, of the world with supply chain shifts as people worry about um, China. But as across the entire world, this hasn't happened at all. And actually, um, you know, India-China trade last year hit new heights again. You know, it crossed the hundred billion dollar mark um, for the first time. Um, and so actually they are working in that sense as trade partners more closely than ever before, despite um, all of these fears and despite nearly going to war on the border, you know? Um, so it's 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 a very complex picture there. Now I think you also asked about Afghanistan and how India is involved in that. Well, I think you know obviously India worries about Afghanistan because of the border with Pakistan, and it worries that um, you know, if there's chaos in Afghanistan, then um, it could become a sponsor again for um, for Islamic terrorism. You know, so Islamists will then come over the border again. We'll have more attacks um, in India. Um, and 
you know, so, you know, India wants to be involved, but actually, you know, really the region is, it's looking like it's, it's, it, you know, China and Russia in particular, in, in particular, you know, they have the most strategic influence there now, you know, um, now that the US has, has gone, um, you know, you have the CSTO, we saw an action recently in Kazakhstan, everyone knows what it is now. Um, you know, Russia has, um, has troops, or it has troops um, in the region, you know, it, it, um, the, the Baikonur um, sort of Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan is about as big as Belgium or something, you know, that's, that's still basically owned by the Russians. Um, and it, you know, and um, it has it has troops in Tajikistan and other places. You know, China now has a security presence on the Tajik border. It doesn't have its it doesn't have soldiers there, but it has people's armed police in the region, and it has a sort of growing security footprint there. Um, and you know, it's it works quite closely with the Russians. Now, it's a bit careful not to step on Russia's toes. You know, China dominates economically. Russia dominates in terms of the security, but they do work more and more closely together. Now, of course, Russia also has quite a good relationship with the Indians, but you know, China and the Indians don't work together at all. So that's kind of that's kind of awkward. But at the moment, I don't really see India having much influence um, at all in Afghanistan. Um, you know, it's been kind of squeezed out a little bit. But I suppose the one piece of good news for India is that, um, is that, is that as much as, you know, um, China is quite happy to see, you know, sort of terrorists disrupting things in India, um, you know, China is equally terrified of terrorism in Afghanistan seeping over the border into China. So, you know, it will do all it can to prevent Afghan, Afghanistan blowing up. So in that sense, you know, India and China actually, um, you know, they have a common cause. Um, amazing analysis. Thank you, Tom. Uh, what about the West here? Because, of course, you know, could argue that Pakistan stole the, they, 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 China stole the Pakistani carpet from under the feet of the West. You know, China was armed, uh, Pakistan was armed by the Americans for decades. Uh, you know, the best fighter is still the F-16 the Americans gave them. Uh, trained their armed forces, gave them buckets, loads of aid, running into many millions, if not billions, and so on. And here we are, you know, virtually less than 20 years, and Pakistan is now lodged in a very different place geopolitically. 20 years after the Afghan war, you know, the Soviets leave, the Russians come back, but I don't see any prospects for a, a, a NATO kind of alliance having much of a presence on that part of South Asia, which must be a worry for India on the one hand, but also a cause for some concern in Beijing because for a long time, the Chinese were satisfied that it wasn't their blood being spilt in those places. Yeah, no, I, I think- West has gone, they will, they will have both, and it's kind of a sweet and sour pill, right? Yes, no, I, I'd agree with that entirely. Um, and actually when I, um, when I looked at, um, at, at, uh, at US bases um, and its allies in the region. I, if I remember rightly, that there isn't a single um, US military presence now on mainland Asia between, um, I think it's Iraq and um, North, uh, and sorry, and South Korea. Uh, you know, it's, it's that entire, you know, the, Eurasia now is basically, is just a US free presence, which is pretty remarkable if you think about, if you think back to how many troops you know they they have had there um over the past 20 years um but yes as you say you know um, um for um for china at the time the only thing worse than having u.s troops on your border as they were you know china has a small border um um with afghanistan even if it is very very mountainous and almost impassable you know the very the, the only thing worse um 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 than having them there was not having them there you know so so yes they were they were quite happy to have the u.s in Afghanistan, spending lots of money on on trying to make it secure because that made it more secure for China as well, um, and also strategically, it meant that the U.S. was um, distracted and focused on on Afghanistan and the Greater Middle East than it was on China. So that allowed China to rise um, without you know as much focus on Asia as perhaps the so-called Asia pivot would have um, would have would have would have would have would have suggested that it that you know that they were um, that it was going to. Um, so, so yes, um, the, the sudden withdrawal of US troops definitely worried China because there was the potential for chaos and there still is, you know, right now, the big fear is of course famine 
in Afghanistan. We have, but we have no idea how that will play out afterwards and whether you know, a general sort of breakdown in governance as partly as a result of that will mean that Afghanistan will once again become a kind of launch pad for lots of sort of terrorist groups. You know, it'll help to kind of foster terrorism in the area. And that's something that, that China absolutely doesn't want. So in that sense, not having US troops there and an allied NATO presence, yeah, I mean, that's not ideal. But um, the same threat to its ally Pakistan, Tom, as well, right? That um, yes, yeah, so I mean, but I, I don't think Pakistan. So you see, sorry, Pakistan is an ally of the West or, or is an ally of China? As China's ally. That you know. Yeah, no, that, it's that it's absolutely a threat. More vulnerable to what happens in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. So you know, I mean, as I said before, CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, is the single biggest location of the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, huge amounts of money have poured in. Um, you know, if you if you add up all the all the projects, they're worth sixty-seven billion dollars. That's you know, that's the best you know rough number I can come up with at the moment. Um, and you know, China has lots of workers there. Um, you know, for, for the main part, not, not guys you know, doing the kind of grunt work, but you know, sort of more senior engineers. Um, and you know, they've been attacked you know, you know, sort of every year for the last decade um, or so. And, you know, and China is, it gets very worried about its people being attacked. You know, it also looks very bad at home, frankly. You're saying people abroad, you can't protect them. Um, and so, yes, it's, it, is, it is deeply worried about that. So it's worried about its investments. It's worried about its people. Um, and it's, you know, and it's worried about having another basket case um, on its border. You know, I mean, uh, um, Pakistan is a big economy compared to the other economies um, um, in the region that border China. And it's, you know, it's an ally. So, of course, you know, the last thing it wants um, is, um, is, is chaos um, in Pakistan. So, yes, it's absolutely a worry to China, um, which is why, um, you know, I, I think it'll, it'll work very, very hard um, to, um, in, as much as it can, um, to keep Afghanistan stable. The problem is, can it do that? You know, and it's always been very, very reluctant to get involved on the ground and, and doesn't want to, you know, China does not want to put troops on the ground in Afghanistan as nor does Russia. You know, Russia's been there, done that, doesn't want to do it again. But, you know, if the country completely dissolves into chaos and um, it, it looks like um, there's a risk that um, that you know this is sort of fostering terrorism over its borders. You know, at some point they, they may have to get involved. It's very interesting, uh, Tom, the way you um, bring all of this into sharp optics. You have talked eloquently about this axis of convenience between Russia and China, and in one of your recent blogs. And and I wanted to um, ask you. Is there an access of commotion in Europe at the moment in dealing <laughs> with both Russia and China? And is there an access of confusion between Europe and US in how to deal with China? And being as well, probably an avid reader of history, would George Kennan advise differently the West how to deal with China today and Russia in your opinion? Wow, these, these are big questions. I'm not a Russia expert. Um, Right. So the first thing is, is that the access of convenience term is not mine. Um, and actually, I, I've sort of argued against it recently. So that term, uh, it was it was um, a um, it was a coinage by a guy called Bobo Lowe, um, who was um, an Australian diplomat who was based in Moscow, who then became an academic um, and yeah. is a sort of and he's an, he's an sort of expert China watcher. I'm sorry, expert Russia watcher who looks at also the Russia China relationship. And he wrote a book about this. It must be in about 2008-ish, and it's called the Axis of Convenience, I, I think, if I remember rightly. And what he was saying was that, you know, at the time, even then, people were, were looking at the very, very early days um, of the of the China-Russian sort of um, intent, on how you want to pronounce it. Um, and, um, and, you know, people were getting so excited about that, saying, oh, you know, perhaps we could have another kind of Sino-Soviet alliance kind of thing with Russia and China. Uh, and, and he was saying, well, it's far too early to, um, to think about that because, you know, there's so little trust there. You know, basically these are two countries that have kind of hated one another for, you know, for hundreds of years. Um, and, you know, the borders have been, you know, they were also sealed off until, until quite recently, you know, um, when, he, um, um, when he wrote that book, um, that, you know, they were just sort of getting together, you know, because it was convenient to, um, do, um, convenient to do so. And, you know, it, 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 no real alliance could possibly come of it. Now, I think at the time he was probably right. Um, and when I wrote my book, um, you know, I was thinking in terms of kind of frenemies, if you like, between the two, but I think that really has shifted. I think it's really shifted um, since sort of 2017, 2018. 
Um, and, you know, since Trump took power, um, uh, you know, the, the whole the whole rivalry between the US and China, and it's, you know, it's, it's as much Xi Jinping as, this, as it is Trump, but, you know, Xi Jinping reacting to, to Trump and this whole proactive thing that I was talking about before in foreign policy, you know, um, it, it's helpful to have a few friends out there. And of course, you know, Russia's relationship with the West as it has deteriorated too. It's just, yes, it is convenient for them to get closer together, but I think it is more than that now. And there does seem to be some kind of personal bond between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. Um, you know, obviously the, 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 the mutual, Propaganda machines on both sides play this up, but you know apparently they, you know, when Xi Jinping presented him with a bottle of vodka on the side of the APEC meeting in Bali back in 2013 for for Putin's birthday, you know they had a few drinks together. Um, certainly back in the day, Xi Jinping, I, I know a guy who was friends with him when they were teenagers. You know he was a big drinker, um, and you know apparently you know they had a few drinks and that kind of lubricated the, the kind of relationship, and then bonds were formed. And you know they've met 38 times. Um, including a few online recently um, since 2013, but you know it's a remarkable number of meetings. And whenever there's a chance to kind of show mutual support, they do so. You know, at Sochi, Xi Jinping was the only big global leader there, and vice versa. Now, um, now at Beijing, you know, they they will always um, support the other, and definitely that is going that is growing, 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 growing closer. So it's no longer an axis of convenience. It's you know it's now I think a genuine political alliance. 38 so that's times that's a lot of vodka. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> that's a lot of vodka, quite right. But of course, vodka is quite similar to um, the Chinese um, clear spirit to um, um, Baidiol. So it's the sort of thing that Xi Jinping might be quite happy drinking. Um, and then the West, yeah, the West obviously is struggling to know how to deal with this. It's very difficult because um, I think until recently it, it hasn't, um, it, it, it hasn't, it, you know, it, it's dealt with Russia and China separately. It's, it saw them as separate challenges. You know, um, China was the big strategic challenge. You know, so there's this whole attempt to, to try to work out a way of containing China's rise, you know, and, and Biden's um, policy here has been trying to shore up um, US um, alliances, you know, and work more with friends again, whereas, whereas Trump didn't really bother with that. Um, and, you know, but Russia was separate, it was kind of an irritant, um, you know, you use sanctions when you kind of need to, um, but it's only really in the last year that they've started talking about China and Russia together. Now, I don't think that's necessarily because despite, although they are political alliances now, I, I, I don't think China and Russia are really, you know, they don't have a single strategy to work together, um, you know, they are sort of closer. So it's not as if, you know, they have military drills and things, but it's not as if, you know, they are, they are sort of, sort of functioning as a single block. But they are both, um, you know, they but they are both seen as as kind of a joint challenge, if you like. And NATO, for the first time, is talking about that. And now the US is beginning to talk about that. So they are beginning to sort of trying to come up, I think, with a kind of joint strategy. But I don't think it's it's really there yet. I mean, how do you do this? Well, I, I, I do think um, the Biden administration's plan to work more closely with allies is really the only way to do it. Um, but it's proving very difficult. Um, and, you know, if you work closely with one ally, you end up, you end up annoying another ally. <laughs> you know, the obvious example of this is AUKUS, you know, the, uh, the Australian, UK, US um, sort of pact where, you know, they're going to help build submarines together, sail them in the Indo-Pacific, but, you know, they've left out France. Um, and then you have, you know, the problem with Europe, you talk about an axis of confusion. Um, you know, yes, the UK and the US will work quite closely together at the moment, partly because of Brexit, the UK wants to look close to, to the US, but, you know, France doesn't want to, um, you know, it doesn't want to panic. And then you have Germany, which has always had a, had a, a close relationship with Russia. Um, and also, I think, because of the history, you mentioned the history, because of the Second World War, you know, it, it, it doesn't want to look sort of aggressive as well, I think. That, that's that's always sort of in the background and then of course you've got the whole kind of energy politics you know it, it needs russian gas desperately badly so it's very very difficult for the west to work together it's always going to be fractured so you know these alliances um, are going to struggle i think to stay together um, in the in the sort of face of this competition so it's a very very difficult thing to do and i mean you know sort of russia here is a sort of irritant it's a huge military power but it's a puny economy Yes, it, you know, it has its, its, its energy leverage, but you've got to think that, you know, it, it's not even in the world's top 10 um, economies now in terms of, in terms of overall GDP. Um, you know, I think South Korea overtook last year, or will overtake this year. 
you know, Italy is considerably bigger. It's not much bigger than Spain. You know, it's, it's not a very big place. You know, in the, in the sort of longer scheme of things, you know, Russia shouldn't matter too much. The only thing is its weaponry. That's the, that's the one thing. And the fact that Putin is willing to, is willing to spend money on a sort of standing army of 900,000 people, or whatever it is, which is completely crazy, but you know, um, that's, the way, that's the way Putin rolls. Um, but, um, you know, so China is, is, is the big strategic enemy really. Um, and, you know, unless China screws up, then China will be the world's biggest economy quite soon. There isn't very much the West can really do about it, to be honest. It, it's got to find a way of, of somehow um, uh, of somehow working with China um, and ensuring that um, that conflict doesn't arise. And that's gonna be the, the, the difficult thing. And because the ideologies are, are, are so different, um, you know, it, it's, that's gonna be very, very tough to do. But I, I think, you know, for the good of the world, they have to come up with some, some kind of way of working together, not working together, sorry, of sort of putting up with one another. Tom, that's, that's wonderful uh, response to this question. I want to argue against myself and see where, <laughs> where, where, where you're coming. One is that actually, you know, this kind of axis of convenience is very much a direct product of Western miscalculation. That by, by boxing two very large Eurasian countries like this um, and, and reducing their options and openly trying to contain them will lead to some manage of convenience is inevitable. And that is exactly what we've got. And it doesn't mean that those two have become, you know, bed buddies. It just means that they see this as a strategic opportunity for them to defend themselves against what the West openly declares to be its yeah. agenda. So that's one side of the argument. The other is, but actually, in many ways, having the two positioned the way they are will make them more defensive, will make them allocate even more resources to unproductive sectors, in particular in case of Russia, as you've mentioned, making it even weaker. And if China comes to rely on Russia, then it'd be leaning on a very weak wall that might weaken China in other parts of Asia. So, so that you could, you, could, you could kind of see in a cynical way, a longer term Western strategy that I don't myself believe in, frankly, that West has a long term strategy in these, in these terms, but that somehow, pulling or pushing China and a weak Russia together may end up giving China more scope in Eurasia, certainly. But by virtue of that, you make China vulnerable in medium term because of Russia's strategic weaknesses that you yourself have so ably uh, put forward. So in, 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 in my, you know, two sides of my brain, where do you see this? Oh, it's, I mean, I can see, you know, I can, I can see truths in both sides. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the big criticism for people who, um, well, so we have, a, we have a guy who's been reading um, our research. Um, investment, he's an investment banker based in Russia. Um, he's a French guy. I, I won't give his name, but you know, he's, basically, he's basically a Putin apologist, okay? And, you know, and his line on this, and I think it, you know, in some sense, it's quite accurate, um, is that the West has been foolish. It should have held Russia close and, by being, um, you know, by kind of seeking conflict with Russia, it's just merely pushed Russia into um, China's arms and China is the big strategic enemy. So that was really, really foolish. Okay, so I, I think you can look at it in those terms, but I'm not really sure the West had that much choice actually. Um, you know, if, if you go back sort of 10 years ago, actually the West was trying to work much more closely with Russia and they were trying to, you know, make, make, make relations better. But Putin at every point has made it impossible. You know, I mean, if you go around um, sort of poisoning enemies of the state, um, you know, in, in foreign countries, you know, sort of potentially, you know, poisoning hundreds of thousands of people, you know, this is, I mean, that was in Salisbury, for example. Um, you know, if you, um, if you let your, um, you know, um, your, uh, your, your very talented computer people um, sort, of, sort of screw with the US election, you know, um, it, it, all these things that, um, that Russia does, you know, how, how are you meant to react to that? You know, are you meant to be friendly with, you know, with, you know, with clearly a very unfriendly state? I think it's very, very difficult. Um, then, you, then you have, you know, ideologically, Russia is just very different from the West. You know, you know it, it, Putin, 
has become more and more authoritarian um, over the years. You know, it, it's a conservative authoritarian state. China is also a conservative authoritarian state, and they both become both more conservative and more authoritarian. So, you know, they they have sort of great similarities. So, you know, it's, I think it's natural for them to work together, and it's natural for the West um, to feel very difficult uh, working with them and to want to push back. So, you know, it, it's 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 I, it's it's hard. In some senses, you can say geostrategically, maybe the West could have been more intelligent about it. Um, but you know, equally, you can say it, it's it's you know it's difficult for them. <laughs> you know, I, I, it, there are there are no easy solutions here. Now you say that um, you know that this uh, alliance between China and Russia could, in time, um, sort of weaken China. Um, I, I I I don't know about that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how that would work. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I don't, you know, obviously clearly Russia needs China more than China needs Russia. And I think, you know, China is powerful enough in time to let Russia go if it needs to, you know, sort of right now their militaries are at a kind of similar level. China will have a much more powerful military, you know, within, within five or 10 years. Um, its economy is 10 times bigger than Russia's. Um, and, you know, every year that gap is only growing wider. Um, you know, it's, it's always very, it's always very helpful to have friends and allies in the world. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's only, it's, it's useful for China to have um, a, a security partner across Eurasia. Um, but does it need Russia? I'm not sure it needs Russia. It makes, it's much easier if it can work with Russia. Um, it'd be problematic if they were at one another's throats. Um, but I'm not sure that Russia will necessarily weaken China. I, I don't quite see how that works. But perhaps you can explain um, more. Um, I'm going to jump in with two quick questions. Anush, would you like to follow up on that? Uh, uh, mainly to respond on that, this is something which is doing the rounds in dark corridors of power. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. OK. Um, I wanted to put two questions to you. And I know that we could continue for another hour or two, and we would definitely have you back with us, Tom. But just two well, we can't questions. because I have because I have another meeting to do about India. So <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but two, two quick questions. Uh, one is moving the dial back a bit to economy and the significance of China's market. Goldman Sachs is pushing in, JP Morgan is going there. Oak Tree Capital just sees the assets of, you know, Evergrande and the Venice project. Is this a sign that, you know, China is aware of its economic allure and financial allure as a market? And it's playing very sophisticated and will become dispensable for Wall Street in many ways. So that will have an influence on geopolitics. And there is nothing too big to fail like the banks in the United States. Evergrande can go down, Alibaba can be disciplined, but at the same time, a sign of maturity that, hey, Oak Tree Capital, you can come and seize the crown jewels of Evergrande. That's my first question on finance and allure and the weight of China's market in the big picture. The second one, what would be your advice to the cinephobes and cinephiles if you have to leave them with one piece of advice from Tom Miller on this call. Okay, wow. Um, can Wall Street um, ignore China? Um, well, it's, that's, that is, I think, actually, the, the, the fear in Wall Street is that it'll, it'll have to at some point. <laughs> I mean, I don't think, I think it's the last thing that Wall Street wants. You know, China is, is still, you know, it's the world's second biggest um, market in some respects. Um, um, you know, it's the well, second biggest economy and, you know, it, it, and huge amounts of growth are still going to come out of China. So, you know, if you're investing in emerging markets around the world, you know, um, it is by far the biggest emerging market in all the indices um, and you want to be able to invest there. Um, and of course, it has, you know, the, the world's biggest growing still consumer market. So, again, you know, it's a huge market for U.S. companies. Um, selling in China, you know, and of course, you know, Wall Street has big investments in those US companies. I mean, if you look at some, um, the last numbers I have in my head, I think for 2019, but that's pre-COVID anyway, so that's quite helpful. You know, um, 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 sales um, by US, um, by, by US companies in China were worth three times US um, exports to China. You know, so, you know, it's a very, very big market. So no one wants to lose that. 
Um, and of course, you know, it's also a massive growing market. You know, the bond market is growing enormously quickly. Um, and, you know, I think people do want access to that. Um, and also, you know, um, as the as the RMB becomes an alternative store of value to the dollar and the euro, which is beginning to happen, then you want to have the chance to be able to invest in that, you know, to be able to hedge with the um, with the RMB. So I think, you know, I, I don't think Wall Street doesn't want to invest in China. I think the fear is that the US will put in place new regulations that mean it's not allowed to, um, or it'll, it'll it'll force Chinese companies who are listed in the US to, um, to, um, to um, delist and make it impossible for say pension providers to put their money into China. And you know, I think that is actually the fear. It's, it's not that you know, the US thinks, oh, we can do without China. You know, they, they will be lobbying very hard, I think, the US government to ensure that, to ensure that, that doesn't happen. Um, but of course, you know, Wall Street will survive without China, but you know, it would, you know, it, 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 nobody wants to lose a big market. Okay, so I, so, so I think that's my sort of, my, my answer to the first question. Um, but I think, you know, but on the China side, you know, China is, you know, it, it wants to have foreign investment, which is why it's opened up its bond markets, um, but it's not the be all and end all for China. You know, sort of, sort of the China strategic position matters more. Um, and um, because the state has a huge role still to play in the economy, um, it, I think it's easier for it to kind of deal with um, some of these companies like, like Evergrande when they get in trouble than perhaps it was the case in the US. You know, you can, you can kind of jump in there and um, sell off bits of the company. It, it, you, can, you, can, you, can, you, can sort of, you can control things more than, more than you can, for example, when we had the financial crisis um, in the West, that was more difficult, I think, to deal with. Um, that's kind of the nature of, of having a very, very state-led economy. It's one of the advantages, um, if you like. Um, you know, one of the disadvantages is that state-led economies tend to be less efficient, but they can be, you know, they, they can be more stable if you manage things properly. Um, so there's that. Now, the, the, you asked too about what should, what should the sinophobes, um, what message should I give to the cyberphobes about China? Um, I think, you know, a lot of people still doubt China. Um, you know, China is seen as the, as the sort of evil enemy um, and people are still convinced that at some point it's all going to blow up. You know, when Gordon Chang wrote his book, The, um, the, um, the Coming Collapse of China, which I think came out in was it 1999 or 2001 or something, anyway, about 20 years ago, you know, he was saying it was going to happen imminently then, it didn't happen. And, you know, for the last 20 years, people have been saying that the economy is going to blow up, you know, um, it's, you know, it's debt laden, it can't possibly survive, you know, it, it was too dependent on exports, you know, it needed to rebalance, you know, its banks were going to collapse, whatever it might be, um, you know, it's construction and economy, blah, blah, blah. It's never happened. Now, you know, China will, will, will go through difficult periods, you know, you know, it's been going through its kind of de-risking, its financial de-risking process for the past few years. Um, we're seeing that now with the big real estate companies, it's trying to squeeze out some of the risk there. Um, and, you know, the economy is clearly going to slow enormously. And now it has its crazy zero COVID policy as well, which is going to add, add more pressure. You know, things can go badly wrong. Um, it's quite possible. But what I'd always say is don't bet against China. You know, this idea that because China is still relatively closed, um, that it's not going to catch up. And when it comes to things like tech, you know, which is so vital to, to China, you know, it wants to be a tech superpower, um, that because, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it, it doesn't have those free flows of, um, of, um, of information which made America strong, America great, that, that China will not be a great or strong as well. Now, it'll make it more difficult for China in some respects, but I would always say never bet against it because, you know, I've been looking at China now. I first, I moved there in 2000, um, so I spent, you know, more than two two decades looking at China, none of these things have happened yet. <laughs> so you know, it, 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 you know, I'm not saying they won't happen, but I'd, I'd equally say you know, there's a very good chance um, that China will find a way. It tends to muddle through, um, and so I don't think it's given that China will fail. And I think the China folks need to realise that. One wonderful, Tom, very much. I have the bittersweet task of closing. It's bitter because. I have to say goodbye, but it's sweet because there are so many other things I wanted to talk to you about. Brexit and China, BRI slow and the future and so on. 
So yes, to be honest, I thought, I thought we were talking about that today. So, you know, yeah, I, I, those I'm are just of, markets yeah. that you're going yeah. to be coming back for. But also take heart in what you said earlier about your travel plans, in that now that you've written uh, China's Asia dream, I think you're now poised to write China's global dream. Yes, your, I don't know. Your, I would, that's in the back of my mind. Book. It's, that's in the back of my mind. Um, it's just well, God, write, writing, well, writing books. It, oh, it's 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 such a headache. But I need to do it at some point. But well, it's because now, there's so it's much stuff out there the now. Public, it's not in the public record, Tom. So I'm afraid our 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 audiences are going to be looking forward to your China's uh, global dream. In, well, in, it's in it's in it's in the client's record. So you know, if you want to be a Gafka client, um, you get all this stuff. You know, it's all been published there. But alas, no, it's um, it's, it's not publicly available. But um, but, but things there is so much stuff now out there. It's 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 much harder to find um, you know, a line that differentiates you. Um, uh, and also, you know, with COVID, I haven't been able to travel. And I, I like to have you know, I'm a journalist at heart, right? So you know, I like to be on the ground, and and and, and I like to have lots of color. Um. But yes, I, I kind of think I'd stop being lazy and actually put it all together into a book again. Well, we look forward yeah. to it. But in the meanwhile, I'm sure that we'll all be reading your, your, your blogs with great interest because you constantly shine the light in places that we are either don't seeing or that, or that uh, they're in the dark. So, so we, we are patient. We'll wait for the third book. But we console ourselves <laughs> by, by, by following your blogs and other writing. So it's a great pleasure to thank you, Tom, for an thank amazing you. conversation with us. Thank and you. And for engaging so fully with us on all of these range of huge, huge importance with us. So thank you very much. Wonderful. You, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun, actually.